Chapter thirty six of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter thirty six. The portrait. In that malady which is termed love, the paroxysms succeed each other at intervals ever accelerating from the moment the disease declares itself by and by the paroxysms are less frequent in proportion as the cure approaches this being laid down as a general axiom and as the leading article of a particular chapter we will now proceed with our recital the next day the day fixed by the king for the first conversation in saint agnaud's room la valliere on opening one of the folds of the screen found upon the floor a letter in the king's handwriting the letter had been passed through a slit in the floor from the lower apartment to her own no indiscreet hand or curious gaze could have brought or did bring this single paper this too was one of malicorne's ideas having seen how very serviceable saint agno would become to the king on account of his apartment he did not wish that the courtier should become still more indispensable as a messenger and so he had on his own private account reserved this last post for himself la valliere most eagerly read the letter which fixed two o'clock that same afternoon for the rendezvous and which indicated the way of raising the trap-door which was constructed out of the flooring make yourself look as beautiful as you can added the postscript of the letter words which astonished the young girl but at the same time reassured her the hours passed away very slowly but the time fixed however arrived at last as punctual as the priestess hero louisa lifted up the trap-door at the last stroke of the hour of two and found the king on the steps waiting for her with the greatest respect in order to give her his hand to descend the delicacy and deference shown in this attention affected her very powerfully at the foot of the staircase the two lovers found the comte who with a smile and a low reverence distinguished by the best taste expressed his thanks to la valliere for the honor she conferred upon him then turning towards the king he said sire our man is here la valliere looked at the king with some uneasiness mademoiselle said the king if i have begged you to do me the honor of coming down here it was from an interested motive i have procured a most admirable portrait painter who is celebrated for the fidelity of his likenesses and i wish you to be kind enough to authorize him to paint yours besides if you positively wish it the portrait shall remain in your own possession la valliere blushed you see said the king to her we shall not be three as you wished but four instead and so long as we are not alone there can be as many present as you please la valliere gently pressed her royal lover's hand shall we pass into the next room sire said saint agno opening the door to let his guest precede him the king walked behind la valliere and fixed his eyes lingeringly and passionately upon that neck as white as snow upon which her long fair ringlets fell in heavy masses la valliere was dressed in a thick silk robe of pearl-gray color with a tinge of rose with jet ornaments which displayed to greater effect the dazzling purity of her skin holding in her slender and transparent hands a bouquet of heartsies bengal roses and clematis surrounded with leaves of the tenderest green above which uprose like a tiny goblet spilling magic influence a harlem tulip of gray and violet tints of a pure and beautiful species which had cost the gardener five years toil of combinations and the king five thousand francs louis had placed this bouquet in la valliere's hand as he saluted her in the room the door of which saint agno had just opened a young man was standing dressed in a purple velvet jacket with beautiful black eyes and long brown hair it was the painter 
his canvas was quite ready and his palette prepared for use he bowed to la valliere with the grave curiosity of an artist who is studying his model saluted the king discreetly as if he did not recognize him and as he would consequently have saluted any other gentleman then leading mademoiselle de la valliere to the seat he had arranged for her he begged her to sit down the young girl assumed an attitude graceful and unrestrained her hands occupied and her limbs reclining on cushions and in order that her gaze might not assume a vague or affected expression the painter begged her to choose some kind of occupation so as to engage her attention whereupon louis the fourteenth smiling sat down on the cushions at la valliere's feet so that she in the reclining posture she had assumed leaning back in the armchair holding her flowers in her hand and he with his eyes raised towards her and fixed devouringly on her face they both together formed so charming a group that the artist contemplated painting it with professional delight while on his side saint agno regarded them with feelings of envy the painter sketched rapidly and very soon beneath the earliest touches of the brush there started into life out of the gray background the gentle poetry breathing face with its soft calm eyes and delicately tinted cheeks and framed in the masses of hair which fell about her neck the lovers however spoke but little and looked at each other a great deal sometimes their eyes became so languishing in their gaze that the painter was obliged to interrupt his work in order to avoid representing an aracena instead of la valliere it was on such occasions that saint agno came to the rescue and recited verses or repeated one of those little tales such as patru related and talamon de rue wrote so cleverly or it might be that la valliere was fatigued and the sitting was therefore suspended for a while and immediately a tray of precious porcelain laden with the most beautiful fruits which could be obtained and rich wines distilling their bright colors in silver goblets beautifully chased served as accessories to the picture of which the painter could but retrace the most ephemeral resemblance louis was intoxicated with love la valliere with happiness saint agno with ambition and this painter was storing up recollections for his old age two hours passed away in this manner and four o'clock having struck la valliere rose and made a sign to the king louis also rose approached the picture and addressed a few flattering remarks to the painter saint agno also praised the picture which as he pretended was already beginning to assume an accurate resemblance la valliere in her turn blushingly thanked the painter and passed into the next room where the king followed her after having previously summoned saint agno will you not come to-morrow he said to la valliere oh sire pray think that some one will be sure to come to my room and will not find me there well what will become of me in that case you are very apprehensive louisa but at all events suppose madame were to send for me oh replied the king will the day never come when you yourself will tell me to brave everything so that i may not have to leave you again on that day sire i shall be quite out of my mind and you must not believe me to-morrow louisa la valliere sighed but without the courage to oppose her royal lover's wish she repeated to-morrow then since you desire it sire and with these words she ran lightly up the stairs and disappeared from her lover's gaze well sire inquired saint agno when she had left well saint agno yesterday i thought myself the happiest of men and does your majesty then regard yourself to-day said the comte smiling as the unhappiest of men no but my love for her is an unquenchable thirst in vain do i drink in vain do i swallow the drops of water which your industry procures for me the more i drink the more unquenchable it becomes sire that is in some degree your own fault and your majesty alone has made the position such as it is you are right in that case therefore the means to be happy is to fancy yourself satisfied and to wait wait you know that word then 
there there sire do not despair i have already been at work on your behalf i have still other resources in store the king shook his head in a despairing manner what sire have you not been satisfied hitherto oh yes indeed yes my dear saint aignan but invent for heaven's sake invent some further project yet sire i undertake to do my best and that is all that any one can do the king wished to see the portrait again as he was unable to see the original he pointed out several alterations to the painter and left the room and then saint aignan dismissed the artist the easel paints and painter himself had scarcely gone when Mollicorn showed his head in the doorway he was received by saint aignan with open arms but still with a little sadness for the cloud which had passed across the royal sun veiled in its turn the faithful satellite and Mollicorn, at a glance perceived the melancholy that brooded on saint aignan's face oh monsieur le comte he said how sad you seem and good reason too my dear monsieur Mollicorn. will you believe that the king is still dissatisfied with his staircase do you mean oh no on the contrary he is delighted with the staircase the decorations of the apartments i suppose don't please him oh he has not even thought of that no indeed it seems that what has dissatisfied the king i will tell you monsieur le comte he is dissatisfied at finding himself the fourth person at a rendezvous of this kind how is it possible you could not have guessed that why how is it likely i could have done so dear monsieur malicorne when i followed the king's instructions to the very letter did his majesty really insist on your being present positively and also required that the painter whom i met downstairs just now should be here too he insisted upon it in that case i can easily understand why his majesty is dissatisfied what dissatisfied that i have so punctually and so literally obeyed his orders i don't understand you malicorne began to scratch his ear as he asked what time did the king fix for the rendezvous in your apartments two o'clock and you were waiting for the king ever since half-past one it would have been a fine thing indeed to have been unpunctual with his majesty Mollicorn, notwithstanding his respect for saint aignan could not help smiling and the painter he said did the king wish him to be here at two o'clock also no but i had him waiting here from midday far better you know for a painter to be kept waiting a couple of hours than the king a single minute Mollicorn began to laugh aloud come dear monsieur Mollicorn," said saint aignan laugh less at me and speak a little more freely i beg well then monsieur le comte if you wish the king to be a little more satisfied the next time he comes ventre saint gris as his grandfather used to say of course i wish it well all you have to do is when the king comes to-morrow to be obliged to go away on a most pressing matter of business which cannot possibly be postponed and stay away for twenty minutes what leave the king alone for twenty minutes cried saint aignan in alarm very well do as you like don't pay any attention to what i say said malicorne moving towards the door nay nay dear monsieur malicorne on the contrary go on i begin to understand you but the painter oh the painter must be half an hour late half an hour do you really think so yes i do decidedly very well then i will do as you tell me and my opinion is that you will be doing perfectly right will you allow me to call upon you for the latest news to-morrow of course i have the honor to be your most respectful servant monsieur de saint aignan said malicorne bowing profoundly and retiring from the room backwards there is no doubt that fellow has more invention than i have said saint aignan as if compelled by his conviction to admit it end of chapter thirty six recording by dion Gines, salt lake city utah